Today's scripture will come from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, and I'll read. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And this was the word of God, amen. At this time, our Reverend Andrew Pack will give us a message of what was so bad about the Tower of Babel. Okay. Good afternoon. All right. Good to see everybody. Okay. <laughs> no response. Good to see everyone. And I'm sure you're glad to see me too, right? So shy, you can't say anything. <laughs> All right, today I want to share with you this mes- message entitled, What Was So Bad About the Tower of Babel? I'm sure we've all heard about the Tower of Babel in one way or another, right? I I believe we've all heard about it, right? That's the the tower where they built it to reach the heavens, and God was not pleased, so he came down, he confused their languages, and scattered all all the people all abroad, so the construction had to stop, right? Um, But what does this really mean Um, and how is it related to us, or how is it relevant to us today? In order to understand about the Tower of Babel, we need to understand about where this story appears in the Bible. We read in Genesis chapter 11, right? Um, You know, we're continuing this study of the book of Genesis. When we first began, I don't know if anybody remembers, but I told you about the structure of the Bible, how the Bible is structured and how it is, um, you know, how its structure informs us. Just like any other book, just like any other writing, the Bible has a structure. So there's an intro, right? When you write something, you write an intro first, right? And then there's a body, the main body. And then there's a conclusion. Does this ring a bell? Do you guys remember this? You learned this in school? The five paragraph essay, which I hated writing. (laughs) So what about the Bible? The Bible, introduction of the Bible is Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. See, it ends where we read today. The body, the main body of the Bible goes from Genesis chapter 12. What, is in, what story begins in Genesis chapter 12? The story of Abraham, right? So Abraham begins the main portion of the, the biblical story. And it goes all the way to the book of Jude. Where is the book of Jude? Right before Revelation. Right? Jude is the second to the last book. And then the conclusion is the book of Revelation, right? So why am I telling you this? Why do we need to know this? Well, because within the introduction, Genesis chapter 11 is sort of like the conclusion of the introduction. Okay? So that means the conclusion of the introduction has to match the conclusion of the entire book, right? Which is the book of Revelation. And do they match? Yes, they do. How? Because of the Tower of Babel. The name Babel in Hebrew is Babel, which is the same name for Babylon. Babylon in Hebrew is Babel, same thing. So Babel and Babylon are the same, okay? And what, how does revolution end? Or not, not revolution, revelation end? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2 says, 
And he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every clean spirit, uh, unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. So towards the end of the book of Revelation, we come to a place where it says Babylon is fallen. Just like the Tower of Babel it gets destroyed, right, by God, so Babylon is fallen, right? So that's the conclusion of the introduction of the Bible as well as the conclusion of the entire Bible. The Bible ends with Babylon being destroyed and God's people coming out of there and establishing a new city. God establishing a new city for his people, which is called the New Jerusalem, right? That's how it ends. And how does Genesis chapter 11 end? Well, it begins with Babel, the, the Tower of Babel. God scatters them abroad so it gets destroyed. And then it ends with the genealogy of Shem's lineage. Okay. Genesis chapter 11 verses 10 through 26 is Shem's genealogy, right? It starts with Shem and goes all the way to Abraham. Okay, so Babylon falls, and who comes out of Babylon? Abraham. Abraham was living there in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is where Babel was built. And he is taken out by God, right? God calls him out, right, to establish a a new nation, a new kingdom, the kingdom of God, right? He goes to Canaan, where Jerusalem is. And Revelation ends with New Jerusalem, okay? You see how these things match? So in Genesis 11, we are given the conclusion of the entire history of redemption, okay? So we are shown what will be our future. And what is our future? Our future is we need to come out of Babylon and enter into the new Jerusalem. That's what, what, what we need to do because we are Abraham's descendants. That's what Abraham did. So that's why, what we need to do. We need to follow in his footsteps. So let's learn about the Tower of Babel a little bit and why it was such a bad thing and how that relates to us today. Who built the Tower of Babel? Do you guys know? It wasn't a guy named Babel. Okay, who built the Tower of Babel? A trivia question that nobody knows. <laughs> so if you look at Genesis chapter 11 verse 2, it says that it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. It was built in a, built on, in a place called Shinar, right? The land of Shinar. So if we know who was ruling over Shinar, we know who built it. Okay? So let's turn to Genesis chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Genesis chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. So here it's talking about the sky, right? Verse 9 says, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. Right? So this guy named Nimrod ruled over the land of Shinar. And in fact, if you read about him, you know, from verse 8, it says that he was a mighty one on the earth, right? A mighty one. The expression mighty one here is not a good thing. It means he was a tyrant. You guys know what a tyrant is, right? very oppressive ruler who rules with violence and forces people. So he was a tyrant who was very powerful, a mighty hunter. So he used his power to turn people against God and gain all the influence and, you know, glory for himself. 
He built this kingdom in the land of Shinar. Its name was Babel. And there he built the Tower of Babel. And, you know, we learn in the book of Genesis genealogies uh, that Peleg, one of Shem's descendants, also participated in building the Tower of Babel too, right? Uh, let's go to Genesis 10.25. So Genesis chapter 10, verse 25 says, Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. So here it says, during Peleg's days, the earth was divided, right? So what that means is, during his days, God confused the languages, so the people had to scatter throughout the world. So it was divided. So Nimrod was the main guy who built the Tower of Babel, and Peleg had participated in that work, in building the, in, uh, the Tower of Babel. Okay, so those are some facts, but let's get to what the, Bab what the Tower of Babel really means. Why was it so bad? Why was building this tower such a bad thing? First of all, it symbolizes the people's distrust of God's covenant. Distrust. They did not trust God. The covenant that we studied about last week was the rainbow covenant, right? And what was that covenant about? God said, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood, right? God made that promise, but people could not trust that. So that's why they built this tall, really high tower so that when the flood comes, they could go to the top so that they won't be killed in the flood. So this was their feeble attempt to overcome the flood. Okay, they didn't trust God. They were dissatisfied or discontented with his judgment. They were like, you know, why would God do this? Why does a loving God do that? You know, we hear that a lot, right? And so they built the Tower of Babel to overcome another flood if it would happen. So this was a human effort for salvation. These human beings united together, okay, they united together, used all of their you know, wisdom, you know, technology, whatever, you know, skills that they had so they could build this tower and it said that it would reach the heavens, right? They wanted to build a tower that would reach heaven. In ancient times, the reason why they built such a tall tower is to establish an empire. You know, somebody would just incite people like, hey, come on, let's do this. We can build this thing. We could save each other. We could protect ourselves. And they brought many nations together, and they all united to build this thing, right? But it was a human effort. It, there's no God in here whatsoever. It was a very human-centered, humanistic effort. How do we know that? If you look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 3, it says, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar, right? So brick replaced stone, and tar replaced mortar. Now this is hard, tar and mortar. I'm not really sure what these things mean, but... Right here, brick and stone is pretty clear. Stone is natural. It's God-made, right? Brick is something that human beings made. It's artificial. You bake it, right? So this right here is telling us, oh, they're using human effort and human technology to gain salvation, okay? So it's sort of what's going on even today in our world, okay? People are saying that, you know, we don't need God. God is dead or whatever. You know, we have science, technology. Our reason 
human reason and intellect could save us. We don't need anything else. All we need to do is just come together, unite our efforts together. You know, unity is a good thing, but if it's against God, then it doesn't necessarily have to be a good thing, right? If human beings are united against God, then that's a bad thing. Okay? And that's what was going on here in the Tower of Babel. So this is sort of like, remember Cain? When after Cain killed Abel, what did God do? God didn't judge him, right? What did God do after Cain killed Abel? God gave him a mark on his forehead, which said, don't touch him, don't hurt him. It was a mark of protection, right? Because Cain complained to God, right? And so even though God showed this mercy to Cain, what did he do? The Bible says he departed from the presence of God. He left God and built a city and named it Enoch. Okay? Why did he build a city? Usually in those days, cities had walls all around with one gate going in and out of it. So cities were usually for protection, to protect themselves from raiders or barbarians or what have you, or animals. So that, was, that appears in Genesis chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. That is the f- very first human-built city that appears in the Bible. And that was something that he did apart from God, okay? And so this is similar to what's going on here in the Tower of Babel. These are all human efforts to protect themselves, to save themselves, to live a a good life apart from God, on their own, independently, right? And that's what the Tower of uh, Babel symbolizes, So is this what some of us, is this what we're doing in our lives today? Are we trying to be independent from God? Saying, I I don't need God in every aspect of our life. You know, I could do other things that I could live on, right? I could work hard. I have my intellect. I have my skills or what have you. But if we start trusting in those things, in our human efforts, then we're sort of going towards the way of the Tower of Babel here. And then also, thirdly, what does the Tower of Babel mean? It mean, Remember, the people that were trying to build the Tower of Babel, they were trying to make a name for themselves. They were trying to glorify themselves, not the name of God. Okay. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, I believe, it says, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make a, ourselves a name otherwise we will be scattered and brought over the face of the whole earth see they wanted to build a city that will reach into heaven they they wanted to go to heaven on their own human efforts and by doing this they wanted to make a name for themselves they wanted to become famous and glorify themselves See, human beings have always been trying to be like God, right? Why did Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, the serpent said, If you eat from this tree, you will be like God, right? That was the thing that won her over. Oh, I could be like God. And that really tempted her, right? This is in line with what the fallen angel Lucifer was thinking when he fell. Please turn to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. Okay. This talks about this being called the morning star. Morning star is Lucifer. Okay. So Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 13 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have uh, have weakened the nations. 
But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. That's what the fallen angel was thinking, and that's what made him fall. Because he was thinking, I could rise above higher than God. I could be better and bigger, stronger, or what have you. That has been the human desire from the beginning. Okay? We all want to be God. At least God of my own life, right? That's the problem. That's what the Tower of Babel symbolizes. This human effort and challenge against God. It's defiance against God, right? So what God did was he came down and confused their languages, right? At first, it says that the whole world used one language and the same words. Have you ever heard that saying language is culture, right? So when it says that they had one language, it, it may mean they, had, they all spoke the same words. Yes, of course. But for us today, what does, that, what does it mean for us today? It means that there were, the human beings now were drawing closer to having a similar, one similar universal culture, civilization. And not only that, they're having similar thoughts, ideologies, beliefs. So right now, think about right now, today. We live, they say we live in a global village, right? The world has gotten smaller. You could take a plane, go around the world, come back in one week or less. Right? The internet, you could talk to people across the world at any time. So th it's a global village. There is a prevailing dominant culture that everybody, whether in America or anywhere you live, you, could, you're, you may not speak the same language, but you could talk to each other about things, about culture, or what, what have you, and you could communicate, Right? So we're getting closer to that, where there's going to be one thing that rules over the whole world, where everybody will know, right? That's what Genesis 11, 1 is telling us, that we're using the same language and the same words. So right now, in, throughout the world, humanity has similar thoughts and ideologies and beliefs, right? Most of the world has accepted this Western culture, American culture, what have you right? They all use it. And we're getting towards that kind of a day when the whole world will have that one culture, right? So that's showing us that we're getting closer to the end, getting closer towards judgment. Because that one culture is not God-centered, right? It's definitely not that. It's human-centered. And that's what they used. They came together to build the Tower of Babel. And that's what humanity is doing right now. Okay? So, how does this story end? Well, it ends when God comes and confuses their languages, right? What that means is they could not communicate together anymore. It means there was strife and conflict. Okay? In other words eventually this is going to turn into a war that's what the bible is prophesying human effort to come together and become one always ends up in a war and human efforts to rely on their own wisdom and reason and intellect always ends up in a war so for example i think i've told you this before in the 18th century, they had something called the Enlightenment, right? Where many philosophers came up with new ideas. And they all said, all of them agreed and said, there's no God, we don't need God, we only need human reason and solidarity, right? Unity, 
then we could do anything. Human beings are the greatest. And they were actually working that out. And then in the 19th century, when they actually came together and worked together, science and technology brought all kinds of advancement and innovations. Things were getting better. But you know what the result of that was? Early 20th century, World War I. And then World War II. Science and innovation was used to kill each other. Okay? It always ends up like this. Human beings, when they come together with their own reason, and using their own powers, without God, always ends up in a war. So if we are getting closer to that day, that means we're getting closer to maybe another World War III. Who knows? Right? So if God is not at the center, human effort always ends up with strife and conflict. So we need to live a God-centered life. And Genesis 11 ends with that, right? The people over here were doing this, but there was this small group of nobodies down here. You know, they were the descendants of Noah and Shem, right? They were trying to live a holy and godly life apart from all that. They did not participate in these things, in the building of the tower. And when, the, when this human effort over here was getting too strong and it was persecuting them, what did they do? They left. They migrated to a different place to start another con uh, nation, right? That was Eber along with Noah and Shem, right? But their son, Peleg, fell into this, and they par he participated in building the Tower of Babel, right? And eventually from that small lineage, this minority of people came Abraham. And so that's why the Bible says we need to become Abraham's descendants. This is, Abraham is showing us the kind of life that the saints in the end time needs to live. We, need, we cannot participate in this over here, the construction of the Tower of Babel, because that's going on right now out in the world. You can't see it, but it's invisible, but it's going on right now. It's happening. So we need to distance ourselves from that, separate ourselves from that, and we need to have our own beliefs and ideologies and culture and thought, and that is God-centered, Christ-centered, right? If we are united, we are united in Christ, not because, you know, of human-centeredness. And we need to come out of Babylon and come into the new city that God will show us, which is called New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. See, God's telling his people, Abraham's descendants, believers of Jesus Christ. He's telling them, look, come out of there. Don't participate in that sin. Don't participate in building the Tower of Babel. That's what the world is doing. Because if you do, the plague's going to fall on you too, right? So you have to come out of there, just as Abraham did, right? So Genesis 11 reflects upon the conclusion of redemptive history. And as I said, it concludes with the people of God entering into new Jerusalem, okay? So just like Abraham, let us spiritually leave our Babylons, right? Let's only trust in God for salvation because as Acts 4.12 says, only in the name of Jesus Christ can we be saved. We cannot go to heaven through our own efforts. That is so clear. That's what the Bible is telling us, right? We need God's grace to go to heaven, right? And let us only glorify the name of God and Jesus Christ and not our own name. 
as John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase, right? That should be in our hearts every day. We have to decrease. We have to disappear. And Christ appears. Christ has to increase in our lives. And let us fully trust in God's covenants, right? They built the Tower of Babel because they didn't trust in God's covenants. We must trust in God's covenant. And what is God's covenant to us? The one thing that he promised to us. Let's read this verse and we will end today's message. Please turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. 1 John chapter 2, verse 25. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 25 says... This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. See, there's only one big promise that God made to us. There are many smaller promises, but they all work towards this one big promise, which is eternal life. If we trust in God, we could have it. If we trust in ourselves, we cannot have it. That's how it is. It's very simple. So God has promised to us eternal life. Let's trust in his covenant and let us not live a human-centered life, but let's live a Christ-centered, God-centered life so that we could be like Abraham. We could come out of Babylon and enter into the new Jerusalem. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this beautiful Lord's Day. We thank you for enabling us to come into your house to worship you. We thank you for the word that you have given to us today. Help us to become Abraham's true descendants by following in his footsteps. May we be able to leave our respective Babylons, leave human-centeredness, humanistic ways, but help us to live God-centered and Christ-centered lives from now on. Father God, many times people rely on their own intellect, reason, and their skills but help us to become more humble before you, Lord, and help us to fully trust and rely only on you, Lord. May we trust in your covenants and trust in the power, saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we may not be allured away or fooled by what this world is teaching us, that when human beings come together and bring their efforts together, that they could save themselves. But help us to awaken from all of this so that we could realize that there is salvation only in Jesus Christ. Father God, moreover, I pray that you will enable us to anoint our lips. I pray you will anoint our lips with your spirit so that we could go out and preach this message to others and share this knowledge with others so that they also may come into salvation in Christ as well. We thank you so much for the grace that you have given to us. May you always provide even more grace in our daily lives so that our walk may be with you and not with this world. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause.